Hello, rugby lovers. Uh, now we have a new edition of uh, Sport for Life Rugby Mania International. Today with us it's uh, Johan van Herden, uh, the player of Dinamo Bucharest, the new uh, champion of Romanian rugby league, and uh, also um, I want to say to him congratulations and happy birthday because yesterday when they uh, win the title uh, of Romanian championship. Also, it was his birthday. Hello, Johan. Hello, Victor. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, it was a very good gift. I think nobody can ask for more on the day. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Congratulations. After after 15 years, Dinamo win back the title. And uh, so I see it was a huge celebration of your club. So um, I hope we'll speak a little bit uh, more about that uh, later on in our podcast. Yes, uh, it's been a long time. Uh, even before the game, some old players, they were talking. Uh, they were saying how what it meant for them, you know, back back then. Uh, I don't think nobody gave us a chance because obviously Baymar has been successful so many years and they're a very good side. Uh, even me when I was there, I know the history also of Bayamari, a small town, and um, how what it means for Bayamari to win. So I think for both teams, it was it was a very special special day. Um, like Nicola said, maybe we wanted it a little bit more, and uh, yeah, it was it was a hard game. I, I mean, even us, we didn't know who was going to win. Uh, we we fought everybody. Bayamari played really hard. It was it was a hard game. I think all of us have sore bodies today <laughs> after that game. Some sore hits, but um, yeah, no, it was a very good game. Yes, uh, it was a really intense game, also for us uh, on the TV. And uh, now I want to say hello to Nicolas Himmelman, the captain of Bayamare. The Bayamare it's the uh, the team who play uh, for uh, 14 years on the road. Uh, the final of. Uh, Championship of rugby, uh, Romanian championship, and also they win, uh, they won the last four titles of a champion in Romania. So it's a big deal for uh, for a club to to do some something like that. And uh, I want to say congratulations also to you, Nicolas. And uh, I am very happy that you accept our invitation to our podcast. How are you? Okay, hello, Victor. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Firstly, this is. Um... It's an honor, obviously, to be here on behalf of myself, my family, and obviously by Mare. Um, yeah, still, still hurting a little bit from yesterday. Emotionally, physically, everything is um is a little bit harder today. Um, obviously, we um we're very proud of the fact that obviously we've been successful over the past. Um, so I can only speak for the last four years. I've I've been at by Mare for four years. Obviously, we've been lucky enough to to win those four consecutive titles. Um, so yeah, no, we are very proud of the fact that we could have done that. And obviously, over the years, you know, success breeds success. So we won it. We won it this one. Make no mistake. Um, we went to Bucharest to go and win. Um, on the day, obviously, it didn't work out for us uh, the way it wanted to. But obviously, that's sport. Sport is um, not just rugby. Any sport is an unforgiving um, game, and. Um, yeah, I always say you have to remember you love rugby. Rugby doesn't love you. So, um, yeah, on the day, obviously, didn't love us that much. No, but uh, it was very, very close, the, the final. If uh, if uh, the, the the game, I would say, um, can uh, can uh, be um, a good game for also for Bayamare if you have more luck, I say. I, it was maybe the thing of the luck, not something else. Bayamare may uh, maybe do a little bit mistakes, not more, but a little bit more than uh, Dinamo. So this is was the 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 how I say the factor uh, who make the 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 winning team. So I, I don't uh, think that you are uh, how I say uh, with something less than Dinamo. You are a little bit uh, unlucky and uh, do a little bit more mistake than Dinamo. So this is how the champion was uh, decided yesterday you you cannot uh, be upset because uh, for me Bayamare do a very good game so uh, next year why not we'll see again uh, Bayamare and Dinamo in uh, in the final and uh, you 
how say you want to take the title from Dinamo. So who knows? We'll see. Yes. Next to me, it's our new host, uh, Paul Ates. Uh, we try to do this podcast to reach um, all over the world because uh, we want to make the Romanian rugby uh, uh, make uh, ac- uh, to be more accessible for uh, all over the world and uh, for the rugby fans. So hello, Paul, and thank you uh, to accept our, my invitation to be uh, to hosting uh, this uh, podcast uh, next to me. Hey. Hello, uh, Victor. Hello, uh, jo- Nicolas. Hello, uh, Johan. It is uh, an enormous pleasure. And uh, once again, thanks for the invitation. Uh, well, what a match. What a match. What a match it was yesterday. Uh, 17 to 14 for Dinamo Bucharest. I extend my congratulations as well to Johan. And I wish him as well a very happy birthday because yesterday, obviously, it was his birthday. For those who don't know, uh, I extend also my congratulations to Nicolas and his uh, side from Bayamare, which reached the 14th final in a row, which is a massive achievement in any kinds of sports, in any kinds of activity. To reach 14 finals, it's not an easy task in a row, I must add, in a row. So 14 finals, 40 consecutive finals. Whoa, what an, what an achievement. And what a match it was. The first half was very even, six points all. The second half was hugely intense, very dramatic. Uh, personally, I hope by Amare won, but it didn't happen. But again, that's rugby, that's sport, that's life. And uh, yeah, we are going to say again, congratulations to Dinamo. Again, congratulations and a very happy birthday to Johan. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Tell me, guys, how do you live the, the game? How it was there on the pitch? Because we can see only on TV what you play, but we don't know what you live. Yeah, it's it's very intense, and uh, I want to know your opinion. Um, how uh, it was for you to how say for you, Johan, to win the title, and for you, Nicolas, to how say to be so close to win the five uh, final on the row. So please tell me how it was there on the pitch. Uh, it was it was very intense, uh, Victor. Very very intense. Uh, a hard fought battle between I think uh, two of the best sides this year, maybe in Romania. Um, both sides deserved it. Um, by Mari, obviously, we knew they were going to come strong, uh, like always. Um, by Mari is a very proud side, and uh, yeah, it was it was hard. It was a hard game. All of us <laughs> feeling our bodies. Uh, we uh, we battled, and I think that was it's good for rugby. The fact that the score was also so close, like you say, uh, maybe our lo- uh, we had a little bit more luck. Um, but yeah, it was uh, it was a really good game. For you, Nicolas, how it was the the how um, <laughs> on on the field? Definitely, you could feel the intensity. Um, I me for me personally, it was the first time. Um, playing rugby in Romania that I actually felt pressure from the crowd as well. Obviously, it was a very hostile environment with all the Dinamo fans and a lot of shouting and screaming. And it was um, it was actually quite difficult to get calls across the field because of the noise, um, which is, I think, something that's good for rugby because that's something that players need to get used to, especially if you want to go to the next level. You know, if you go and play the games at the World Cup, obviously there's thousands of people so it's something to get used to um physically the game was extremely hard and um yeah obviously dinamo has a few big boys so definitely we also have uh, sore bodies today um yeah overall i think rugby wise you know there was definitely a lot of mistakes but intensity wise i think it was it was a pretty good game yes indeed uh, for all, also for us on the tv it was very intense we have for me i didn't know until the last minute who will be the winning team so it's good for show it's good for fans it's good for uh, i'll say for the television who want to uh, to promote uh, this uh, this uh, sport on the romanian channel because uh, we know uh, on the last years uh, romanian rugby is not so popular uh, badly for us back then uh, like in 80s or 90s 
uh, in Romania, rugby it was very popular. We have a lot of fans uh, on the uh, on the stadium. We have a lot of fans uh, supporting the teams. But uh, on the f- last few years, we lose all those fans. We lose a lot of teams. We lose um, how to say uh, a lot of rugby players in Romania. So for me uh, to see yesterday uh, this game to see. Uh, not so many people, uh, let's be honest, uh, on the on the stadium, but it was much more than uh, previous years. And uh, also the, the crowd, it was a little bit uh, more uh, active and supporting the team. So uh, it, it is very good. Also, I see on the semi-final in Bayer Mare, uh, people are shouting and um, uh, supporting their teams. So it was very, very good. And for me, I say, okay, maybe it's a new start, maybe it's a new beginning for Romanian rugby, because uh, I think we deserve, and I think you, uh, the rugby players, you deserve more fans, you deserve more attention, you deserve to be much more promote on the television television, and also on the social media, because until now, we didn't see that, and uh, I think it's very upset for me because I see more soccer on TV and less rugby. So we try here with this podcast to change that situation, to speak about the Romanian rugby, to speak about uh, international rugby and uh, how say to promote our league all over the world. Maybe, maybe also uh, we keep the Romanian fans more connected with also uh, Roman, uh, rugby in the world. So Please tell me about your fans because I see uh, Dinamo have a lot of fans also from the soccer uh, league and uh, you, Nicolas, who have uh, uh, intense uh, fans in Bayamare who support you all over the place. So how do you feel their support? Johan, I start with you. Um, or Nicolas. Yeah, I, Nicolas. I, okay, I'll, I'll go. Um, um, Bayamare has a it's a small circle, but it definitely is a loving circle. When you play home here, you definitely feel the fans. Um, it's it's a, I I enjoy obviously home games a lot here at Baimare because like um, like you said, you you definitely do feel the support. Um, I don't think Baimare has thousands or millions of supporters, but the people that do love the game here, they love it very much, um, and is very passionate about rugby and about this team. Um, so yeah obviously as a player you definitely feel that and it uh, contributes to obviously your performance a lot for you Johan how it was uh, the fans because Dinamo have the most uh, how to say passionate uh, supporters in Romania uh, also they are very numerous how do you feel there Lo? yes you're, you're right uh, Victor um even like the last two games, the soccer fans have also come to support us. Um, but I've been to a handball game just before. I think in general, uh, those people, they support everybody, uh, all the sports in Dinamo. They are very passionate for Dinamo. People that stay in Bucharest, uh, I think in different locations, uh, different zones, uh, some support Stawa, some repeat uh, some Dinamo, but um, yeah, for sure. If you come to Stefan Chalmari, I've seen some crazy things happening <laughs> with the police before games, and they have to stop it. It's incredible how how people. I just wish that people would love rugby so much. You know, it's unfortunate that in Romania we have such a good history, also um, that people, like you were saying, that they watch more uh, soccer on the on the TV than uh, than rugby because it's it, that's the only thing that shows. It's football everywhere, soccer everywhere. Um, and I wish that they could bring rugby more like that. So that the people know, I think some people, the uh, Romanian people, they don't know about rugby or they are scared. I've, been to, I've spoken to a lot of people that's become rugby lovers over the years that they were scared of the sport. They say it's very physical. It's, it's very, um, when they watch it, they are scared for, for the players. But um, when, when people came, even yesterday, uh, a lot of people that never knew rugby, they they came and they started watching and they came to Ark and they enjoyed the atmosphere. Um, yes, I was surprised that there was going to be so many Dinamo fans there. I thought Bayamari was going to be more because they've always done that. The, the Bayamari supporters, 
I know it because I also played there. Um, and you know, to go and play in Bayamare, it is it is scary. It's scary how those people. It feels like they are on the field with you. You feel intimidated, and I think that is why if you win in Bayamare, it it is very hard. It it doesn't often happen. Uh, Bayamare is such a small town with such um hard warm people that love the sport and they love you as a player and they will support you and you feel it and when you go in town they will always greet you they will come to you you know Bucharest is obviously much bigger a lot of people don't know only the rugby people that uh, support rugby they will they will greet you yeah no yes yesterday I think definitely the supporters helped uh, had, a, had a hand in uh, the win yes indeed Paul if you have some question for our guest please You are Rokron? Yeah, of course. I, I was thinking while uh, Johan spoke about the fans, I was thinking about how different it was to play for uh, Dinamo yesterday, was comparing to the times you played in Bayamar, in terms of uh, uh, the support of the fans and the atmosphere, if it was, you know, any kind of difference uh, and stuff like that. Um, yes, um, normally for Dinamo, there wasn't a lot of fans always at the games. Uh, only maybe our friends and family that came to watch normally. This was the case. But yesterday, it was a lot of other people, um, new faces, uh, people from from the club that uh, normally, all the sports, actually, they came to support, which never happened before. They never got involved because everybody was supporting the handball or the, the soccer much more but yesterday all those people came together uh, because it was for the first time that um, Dinamo play in a final after 15 years so I think that everybody was just so excited and, and happy to finally see something like this and it, it felt very special and do you think that the fans made the difference in the end uh, did they help you in, in any way like you know a 16th player You know, some people sometimes say that the crowd um, doesn't have an effect because they cannot play the game. They are not on the field. But I feel that uh, I'm getting goosebumps that uh, when those people were cheering for us on the field, when they were shouting for us, it encouraged us to lift more. Even when we were behind, when Bayamari scored the try, uh, we were behind. Uh, but the fans just kept on cheering for us and they never stopped. And I think that just gave us a little bit extra motivation to to work hard and to to get the title tell me guys um how it was the week before the final for you how do you uh prepare it and um i want to know also some details before uh enter the game uh, on the pitch what uh, the coach tell you uh what uh, our your uh, team players Team colleagues, they um, uh, how say uh, start to um, uh, to cheer you, to uh, uh, prepare you for the game. Tell me more about that. How it was the game before the week, uh, the week before the game, and also the minutes before the game. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll I'll start. Um, I so I don't think you do too much differently. Um, than normal games or that's how I like to approach it obviously it's already a high pressure situation so you don't want to put extra pressure um, by putting extra tags on a game that basically yes it is a final and I promise you every single player knows it's a final you don't have to tell them um, so for me it's about just being as normal as possible during the week so we had normal training schedule gym session um, obviously we had to put a few a few extra days in obviously for travel and then you need to recover and uh, we had a little captain's training which was uh, interesting in the snow um and then obviously before the game for us the message to us was was quite simple it was the fact that obviously we can be the first team in romanian sporting history i think to win five titles in a row so um again i think everyone knew it It's unnecessary to to hammer on it the whole time because again it just loads it just loads it up um, and puts more wood on your back and you have to carry obviously all of that with you. 
so yeah, that's basically what we saw and heard the whole week. Is obviously to that that uh, that that obviously there's um there's another title on the line, and you know being able to make history. Um, yeah, and obviously, unfortunately, fell short this time. But like I said before, that's obviously how sport works and life in general. You have ups and downs, and now obviously for for a long time we've been the hunted and now they've caught us and now obviously we have to hunt again so yeah we'll see how the future how the future goes and you johan how uh how you prepared the final uh, i think nicolas said said it you know he said uh he hit the point exactly um you prepare as you prepare any game but you know what was special was um for a lot of boys in our team um, I think we were only five that has won a championship in Romania in general, or maybe, I don't know, any, everywhere else. We were just five boys that played in these five big finals, has won the title, and the rest, it was new for them. There was a lot of uh, new players that never, never played in a final, that never, never uh, was there. So, I mean... You know, we prepared for the game before and I'm, so I'm being honest that our coaches said that we were making some mistakes at training and they were said, if you are going to make these mistakes, Bahamar is going to give you 50 points. We knew, we knew that if we didn't prepare well, uh, it was hard, like Nicolas said, also with the snow, it started snowing in Bucharest and uh, unfortunately at Dinamo, we didn't, they haven't built a new stadium there, so we didn't have um, the facilities to train well. I remember two days before that uh, we came to the the soccer field to to train there. Um, it was hard for for us to to run over there. I think Bahamari is more used to the snow because <laughs> the day the weather is always it's always snowing. And I mean, in the now in the couple of few past years, it hasn't really snowed in Bucharest in this time. Only in January or February. So the conditions was for everybody uh, was hard. Obviously for Bahamari traveling so far. Uh, I remember those travels. It's it's not nice. Uh, it's it's very hard. Um, uh, and we were we yeah we were preparing very hard. We prepared actually. Um, to be honest, we prepared this whole year hard, uh, harder than in the past. Um, we had a new coach. He did some things with us that took us out of our comfort zone. Uh, I think some of us were uh, like sometimes tired and fed up with being at training. We even had some conversations between us, uh, a lot of tension, but uh, at the end of the day, it paid off. Uh, I see some videos before uh, the final, before uh, the big day, and uh, how you say in Bucharest it was snowing and uh, uh, the pitch, it was very hard. I see that on TV and uh, I want to make a, a suggestion, suggestion. Uh, for uh, Bayamara, it's a massive team. It was much uh, harder for you to play on that pitch, and maybe this is uh, what uh, the I would say. It was a little bit difficult for you to express your game because Bayamare have a lot of contact game, uh, also with the uh, uh, how say on the malls and uh, uh, to to engage very hard uh, with your uh, with your scrum. So how it was for you, Nicolas, uh, the, the pitch? It was much harder for you to play? Um, no, no, I think obviously this time of year, again, I'm, I can only speak for the last four years that I've been here. I know obviously playing rugby in December here is quite difficult. It constantly rains. It does all these things. Um, I think me personally, I think if I can speak for my team, I think we enjoy a little bit drier weather better. Obviously, we're not as big as the other teams, so we like to move the ball around a lot. I think, I think uh, I, I'm speaking under correction here, might be wrong, but I think Dinamo was like 60 or even more kilograms heavier than us in the front. So obviously, we wanted to run the ball a little bit more and, and uh, pass the ball, move it a little bit. Um, obviously, the weather makes that quite difficult. Obviously, if the ball hits the ground once, it's wet. It's difficult to, to move it along. Um, and then, obviously, you have to give credit for Dinamo's defence because they shut down that space really quick. So, you can't move the balls around that easily. Now, you have to go through the heavy traffic and that becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, yeah, obviously, they've done their homework really well on, on our on our lineouts. Um, they forced a lot of mistakes there. Um, and it's these, these mistakes that you talked about that um, could have cost us the game, you know. Um, 
in hindsight, looking back at the game, obviously maybe we could have done some things differently. But, you know, um, looking back, you're always going to be much smarter than you were in the moment. So, um, yeah, the the conditions um, wasn't great, but both teams play in that conditions. So um, you, you, have, you, you can't do anything else but give credit to Dynamo. They, they defended very well. And obviously they use the opportunities. Um, they use the opportunities when they when they got in range to get points. Credit to to Yondra, who's their kicker. <laughs> yeah, he, he doesn't miss miss a lot. Um, and obviously we knew that too before the game. So um, no, on the day, um, I think things fell into place for the normal, and it fell a little bit apart for us. Thank you, Nicolas. Johan, you come from uh, South Africa to Romania to Bayamari. You make history also there. You play finals, you win them. And uh, now you are at Dynamo. Uh, you won the first title uh, for Dynamo after 15 years. What's next for you? <laughs> you know, it was funny. Before the game, I said to the boys, <laughs> you know, uh, when you come to a certain age, everybody asks you, when are you retiring? When are you retiring? When <laughs> you know it, it it's something that's been asked a lot of times for me. And uh, some of them, it feels like they want me to retire. So I said before <laughs> the game, I said before the game that I, I will retire if we win the final. You <laughs> and how you do that? Don't tell but, me that. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> I, I was thinking about it. Um, my girlfriend now, my new Romanian girlfriend, she started to like rugby, you know. It's it's funny. And uh, and her friends, all the, she brought new people to the, to the game. Yes. And that gave me the motivation to go maybe one more or two more years. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see how the body feels. Um, but... Um, they gave me the motivation and said, please, we started liking rugby now. Now you want to retire. <laughs> so I, I said to the boys, and I think this motivated them a lot to, to win because they wanted me to retire. And they asked me after the game, so are you retiring? And I said, no. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, Laura Laura still wants to, uh, wants to watch rugby. She's been enjoying it. She made me a nice banner for my birthday. You know, it was very special. I see that on TV. Yes, yes, she made me a very nice banner. She's very passionate. Um, she supported me a lot uh, this year. Unfortunately, uh, you know, um, it's, uh, Romania is different to South Africa. Nicholas, uh, as his wife is also South African, and he's got his daughter, and they do they they know rugby. You know, it's like they they've they've they it in their blood. They know how it works. But for Laura, it was different. Um, she she's she really supported me, um, not knowing rugby, not knowing how it was. Um, and uh, yeah, I I feel I feel very special, and I think it was very special on the day. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, and please don't retire this year. Maybe you think to uh, to play another two years because if you retire, the Romanian rugby league will be much uh, I would say poor without you. So uh, don't think of retirement. We need you to play. Also, I think uh, you don't have the last word of the Romanian rugby team. I I also see you there because your experience it's so needed at our team. You see how we do on the World Cup. It was not so great for us uh, because uh, we miss you guys with um, uh, the, the the players with a lot of experience. Our team um, uh, doesn't have you on uh, on the World Cup, so I we can see obvious that. Uh, you, uh, we still need you on the team. We, uh, you don't have the last word uh, yet, of my opinion. <laughs> um, yes, maybe I must wait uh, till Nicolas can also qualify, uh, because it would be nice to play with him. You know, he can. He's also. He will also be eligible soon. Um, yes. No. I, I. I also. I also want to uh, at least um, uh, retire from the national team because it was special for me playing there. You know. Uh, it's been it's been special for me to represent the country, and I appreciate all the people loving me in this country. You know, it, 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 when you come to someone comes to you to the street on the street, that they know soccer too much, you know, and they come and they say, Johan, you know, you're an inspiration for us. Uh, it's it's very special for me. Um, this, so yeah, no, I, I was sad about the World Cup not uh, being able to play there. Um, I know I posted something yesterday. 
uh, when I said that I was upset and I'll make it, I'm serious about it. I'm, I'm upset that I, I wasn't there. I, I really wanted to play against South Africa. I think even Nicolas, if we feel the same way that um, we, we would like to play against our home country, you know, um, and I think in that game, you would give even more because you, you South Africans, we are like this. If we play against each other, we want to hurt each other. You know, we want to go hard because we know how, what we can handle. Uh, we we were bo- we were born into rugby, if I can say it like that. Uh, it's uh, rugby in South Africa is very special. Uh, the, the diversity that is in the country um, brings a lot of people together, black and white. It's been a thing in the past with apartheid and so on, and um, it's brought us together. You know, there was a lot of hatred, uh, which I would say, to, towards each other in the past. But uh, rugby actually brought black and white people together. And that's why you always see so special with uh, Sia Kulisi, that's the captain. You know, um, you see him that brought the nation together, the president, uh, because some black people, they, they don't like rugby. They f- they feel it was part of apartheid, what happened in the past, you know. And uh, But because there was a black captain and all of this, um, it, it brought that country together. And it's it's very special for us uh, as, as South Africans. To uh, I know I I feel Romanian now, but uh, it obviously still South Africa is in my blood, and I uh, still have a special place uh, for South Africa. But yeah, no, it's it, rugby is, is a beautiful sport. Uh, for us, it was amazing to see uh, South Africa winning the World Cup, and also I see on the TV the the crowds on the streets of uh, of South Africa cheering the 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 team. It was uh, amazing. Also, I see tears on the the, the player size. It was it was great. Uh, my my skin, it's uh, you know, is very is very passionate. It's very uh, amazing for a, a supporter to see that uh, images. Also, I think for the players uh, that uh, they uh, won for the second time the world uh, champion. But uh, Nicolas, until we go to speak about uh, the World Cup, because I want also to speak uh, about uh, that. Tell me. Uh, Johan told me you are um, next to be eligible for Romanian team. You think to do that? You think to come to play for Romania if they, uh, the the coaches they will think about you to play for us? Um, yeah. So so yes. Firstly, obviously, I would never say no to obviously such an honor. Um, when I when I first came to Romania in two thousand nineteen. Um, the rule at the time was for a foreign player to play three years, obviously without leaving the country for a certain amount of days. So I had high hopes to qualify for the World Cup and go to the World Cup. Um, two years later, they um, requested all the documents and they sent it to IRB to um, make me eligible, basically. And IRB turned it down and said... Um, that the rule changed to five years. So then I basically missed that window. Um, but yeah, so basically it's like present time. Uh, it's almost finished. And um, in March next year, I would be available if they would have me. Um, if they would if they would have me, then I will definitely not say no. Or, you know, I, I try not to be bigger than the game. So if there's an opportunity for, for me to represent Romania, I will definitely... Definitely do it. Thank you, Nicolas. Paul, if you have some question for our guest. Yeah, I do. Um, and especially to both of them, obviously. <laughs> But um, I was wondering, you know, Nicolas played um, in his youth uh, for uh, Cheetahs and um, not so many games, but obviously, uh, you know, many South African legends played for that club. How um, big was that for you? Uh, to to play for um, Cheetahs. Growing up, um, growing up, I grew up as a in a blue bull household. Um, <laughs> my father is a big uh, Bulls supporter. My grandfather, funny enough, was a Western support, uh, Western Province supporter. So um, obviously, like you said, in in South Africa, rugby is very big, and I had the I had the fortunate upbringing of being involved in a community where the people absolutely love the rugby or. Our neighbors used to put flags up every Saturday if the Cheetahs play. So the Cheetahs flag was across the street and this side is a Bulls flag. And 
you basically just grow up in a community where everyone loves rugby. And from a small age, you know all the players. There's there's not a player that will walk by you in the street that you won't know. Um, so growing up, I always wanted to play for the Bulls. Um, you know, you sing the Blue Bulls song and you have all the Blue Bulls players' names on your back. And after school, I started my rugby career at the Bulls. I went to the Bulls junior systems and played there for the Bulls. I played for the University of Pretoria. Um, and um, obviously things happened and I signed a contract with the Cheetahs and basically continued my career there. there I played my first senior rugby as Johan would obviously know the competitions. They don't... I don't think that competition exists anymore today. So it was Vodacom Cup where you like kind of get juniors into senior rugby. It was juniors and seniors mixed. Um, and then obviously in 2007, I had the privilege of making my Curry Cup debut. And at that point, I thought to myself, wow, obviously this is, as a as a guy who loves rugby and as a guy who, who came up, you know, if it was Curry Cup final, it's, there's a fire in every single yard in the street and everyone's having a good time. So it was a very, very um, big privilege. I wouldn't even say just just to play in 2007. I would I was involved in 2016, but then I was basically just um, a bag holder or a piece of equipment. I was just there for trainings. Um, even then, I was very proud of the fact that I could be there. So obviously, the she does have a long and rich history. Um, a lot of Big names come from there. Um, in a in a way, it's a, like a breeding ground for other South African teams. You know, guys go through the ranks there first, and obviously get picked up by bigger teams. So yes, to have played for the Cheetahs is definitely one of the, the highlights of my career. Guys, and I would like. Uh, sorry, sorry, Bogdan. No, please, I, please, please. I have, please. have also a question for for Johan because he played not only in South Africa, he played several matches also in France. And uh, I want a, a comparison between the, the South African system, which is, as Johan uh, said uh, earlier, and uh, Nicolas as well, a very competitive one, and the French one, which is, involves a lot of money, also very competitive. And I want to see, I want to ask Johan, what's the, what's his perspective? Also, South Africa played against France, as we know, uh, in the Rugby World Cup. Um, I think uh, both teams love rugby. Uh, also in France, it's it's big. Rugby is big. The crowds that come to the game, it's amazing to see the passion of the fans. You know, what was surprising for me when I came to France, the supporters knew it before I knew it, that I was going there. I have no idea how. The, uh, even when I left, I knew I was going to leave. <laughs> it's a, They contact you, people contact you, and they write to you. You know, um, French people are very passionate for, for rugby, as well as South Africa. Um, you know, for me, South Africa, I think, is a little bit more physical in a way, how we play. The French like to be more flourish. They like to run with the ball more. Also, South Africa has that ability, but I think South Africa believes in being physical, dominant in the front, you know, with the forwards, uh, the French team, when I was there, they said to me that um, you are not going to pass or do anything. You just have to carry, get over the advantage line. And then we play with the backs. I think this is how French rugby works. They like to play with the backs. I think they like flashy rugby, you know. South Africa is there to do the hard work, to put in the hard work. Um, but yeah, I think the nations both and France has picked up their physicality over the years. I think with their with the top fourteen bringing in players from different countries, um, obviously South Africa don't doesn't bring in foreigners. Uh, it's rare. It happened in the past, maybe one or two, but you you'll never see a foreigner in a South African team because we breed a lot of players. You know, their um, school rugby is very big, like Nicholas was saying. Um, me and Nicholas have a very similar background. Uh, I also come from Pretoria. My my family was also Blue Bulls uh, supporters. And I changed my support because of that, because my dad was so passionate about the Blue Bulls. I said, no, I want to root for another team. So I root for the Western province. And um, I think it's also some sad things that happened to me that uh, they I was in a small school in South Africa and they don't often look at you. You know, uh, there it's about the school that you are in. Um, I, I wasn't looked at there. So I had to go play my rugby for another team, uh, which was the Pumas. Um, that's where I played my, where I got my first contract. I was also at the University of Pretoria, like Nicolas. Um, they, I got an opportunity to go to the Pumas. They, they looked at a coach, Donny de Villiers, that was actually in Romania. 
that coached here, he um, he was my first coach that gave me a contract. Eleven years later, we saw each other in Romania. It was it was amazing, you know. Um, and also, you guys remember Chester Williams came to Romania. Yes. Um, he, he won a title. Was, uh, I think he was the coach of Timisoara, if I'm correct. Yes, but he was. He was also at Dinamo. He was also yeah. a coach at Dinamo. He he came first time there. He won the title for them back then. I think it was 2008, if I'm not mistaken. Um, then he went to Timisoara, and he won a lot of titles with uh, with Timisoara against Bayamari. I remember he came to me after the games and said to me, "Johan, you know you cannot beat me." <laughs> it is amazing how that guy knew Romanian rugby and how to beat Bayamari. It was, it was, you know, he left. Uh, he had some problems because his wife never came. His wife had a good job there. Um, it's He's got a very interesting story. His wife worked for Nelson Mandela back in the day. Oh. Um, yes. And Chester, Chester was a guy that um, was treated very badly. He was one of the black, first black people to play for the Springbok. You know, um, he stayed in different hotels than the team. And to think his wife worked for Mandela. She was also a white lady. Um, she worked for... Uh, Mandela, which is also back then, you know, part of the it was it's very special. South Africa, South Africa is special in general. Um, uh, rugby for them, it it means a lot. Like I was saying it before, South Africa means a lot for South Africans. Not just not just as, as a sport, but as something that brings people together. Um, we are very passionate. Um, you know, for me also to say this that I I hope for Nicolas to play for the national team. I think the national team may uh, can benefit from this. Nicolas knows the game. He's uh, he's he comes from a rugby family. His brother also plays big rugby. Um, I can't. I don't know at the moment where your brother plays, Nicolas. But at the Bulls. Um, he's at the Bulls now. Oh, he's at the Bulls. <laughs> I oh, think yeah. for us, for it's us, it was. A, for us, it was a dream to play for the Blue Bulls for me and Nicolas, you know, um, because coming from Pretoria, uh, it's it's amazing there how the people love rugby. <laughs> Everybody always say this, uh, the, the Bulls supporters are the worst because they will scream at you, they will shout at you, they will swear at you. They fight at the games because of rugby. <laughs> it's very funny. Um, but yeah, no, the, the difference between South Africa and, and France is, uh, I think, just different countries it's not necessarily rugby because i think both teams love rugby yes i i, I think uh, rugby for south africans uh, bring the nation together what uh, i think that um, uh, make the connection between uh, white people and black people and uh, make you to overpass some difficulties that uh, south africans have have in the past and uh, what you say about chester yes he do and he write uh, also history for Romanian championship. Uh, he was a very good friend with Dan Dino, the former um, investor in, in Timisoara, also um, very high connected on the rugby uh, world wide. And um, uh, for us, he sadly that Dan Dino is no longer an uh, investor in uh, Romanian rugby. Is now our rugby is much poor without uh, him. Also uh, without Chester because uh, uh, Romanian uh, people love uh, Chester for what he represents and uh, for uh, also the history of the rugby. Uh, you know, uh, he do he do such a lot of things for for rugby that uh, maybe uh, now over the years we, we can uh, understand what the difference uh, he made for. For uh, how say for the South African nation, uh, so it was great. Uh, Dandino spoke about uh, uh, the funeral of uh, of Chester, uh, how the people it was uh, devastating uh, all over uh, the South Africa, and uh, it was pretty intense to to hear those story. You know, so uh, I hear you, Johan, speak uh, speaking about. Uh, the foreigns and uh, I want to speak a, a little bit of that for our uh, championship. And uh, I know you, Nicolas, you told uh, Adrian Groza, uh, you told something that uh, I have something against the uh, foreigns. So it's not true. I don't have nothing against uh, foreigns because also I'm a foreign in Belgium. So I don't live in Romania. I'm in another country. I know how it 
uh, it goes to be a stranger uh, to another country and uh, maybe people uh, they don't embrace you like you think or how you wish to do that but i i say uh, only for our championship i say uh, to uh, encourage the the clubs to invest in youth you need to have some stronger rules to not uh, how say allow to bring how many uh, stranger do you want for a club and to have more uh, how say more stronger rules to say okay you are allowed to have 10 uh, uh, foreigners in uh, in a team you start with seven uh, or i don't know i give an example i don't know and then you need to have also uh, natives to encourage the national team to to help the national team to to have uh, all over the years new players because if you are lazy because i think they are lazy they prefer to bring uh, foreigners instead to invest in youth to invest in uh, our future in our national team they prefer to bring foreigners it's much easier they don't have to work harder they say okay we go in south africa or i don't know in uh, pacific uh, uh, how to say uh, countries and we bring uh, uh, players they are already uh, been uh, how to say um, uh, uh, top and uh, they are very good players and uh, it's much easier for us to help us to win the title or to make our game uh, much easier but uh, if you look on the future is not good for our national team and now we are seeing the the results because if uh, and uh, uh, I want you to answer this question and then to uh, overpass uh, to speak about the workup because you, you can see the the workup for us doesn't uh, goes so good. So tell me first uh, you Nicolas and Johan about um, how you see the the rules in Romania <laughs> about uh, the forums and uh, how can help our rugby. Okay, so um, speaking as a foreigner, still obviously I'm uh, hope to be Romanian next year. Um, so as a foreigner, it's like you said, you live in Belgium. It's difficult to to come, and especially if you come to do a job here. Okay, we I came here to play rugby. I didn't come here to upset people. I brought my whole family over, and I came here to do a job. Obviously, a job that I love, and I I believe that I play with my heart on my sleeve. You can see my intentions. It's clear. I, I am. I play every Saturday to win, and if I come short, I'm sad about it. It's not, not like um, I want the team to lose or anything. Um, I don't have my own agenda. Um, obviously, I'm I'm here for the group. I don't have secrets regarding rugby. I share all my knowledge freely. It puts pressure on me to obviously look at the game constantly, look at the game differently. So. If you want to have a line-out move, I will give you one because I will think of a new one. It It's something that progressively makes it better for me. So that's just firstly how I see it. And then I came to Romania in 2019. I went through all the difficult things that a new guy in a team has to go through. You know, you sit in the front of the bus. You have to take all the... Um, Critics, you know, the guys criticize you for making one mistake because remember you are a foreigner, so there's a lot of there's a lot of expectancy here. You understand? Like people expect something from you. So now if you don't if you are not perfect one hundred percent of the time, you will be criticized. Um that is that is um tiring. Um it's mentally draining. So I've done all of that. So I came through all of those steps, so then it makes it difficult for me to still see that people do not appreciate foreigners so much. Um, but then in saying that, I also do understand the value of um, developing your own players. Um, I do think the rules in the... Com I, don't, I don't think the rules in the competition is wrong, obviously, because they, they make it... They make the five-year contract deal... To have those foreign players qualify for Romania. The young foreign players you see in Romania, they I can almost guarantee you all of them have a five-year contract and they are on the on that contract phase where they will qualify to play for Romania. So I can speak of the guys in our team, for example. So say you take the lucid prop James Scott. He came in as an under-23 player, he signed for five years and he wants to play for Romania. Um 
And that goes for all the juniors at the team. In in Romania, I I do believe you you obviously you speak about the development, but it's very important that you do not drop the level to accommodate players. You should get the players ready for the level. That obviously makes it a little bit slower. Again, I can only speak for Bayamare. You see one or two, three maximum juniors coming through the system every year. So we have a you guys probably see him play for the or saw him play for the Wolves. Um Andre Schultz. Um is I think a guy with a lot of potential. A lot of potential. He, he, like I'm an older player now. I'm not I'm not as old as Johan yet. But um <laughs> I've played a lot of rugby and obviously seen a lot of guys. I think this guy has big potential and he'll probably be with Romania in the future. And it will be nice to see more of those players because that makes everything better. I think obviously there's always this talk about money, not just in Romania, all over the world in sport. Money, you see again now, uh, one of the American teams just folded, disappeared. New York is gone. So money is obviously a constant discussion in development of players. But one thing that you can easily do, easily to develop players, is you can take players from the normal. I don't know, I don't know the clubs in Bucharest, so I don't want to be crucified, but I can say, okay, again, I can speak for Bayamare. So Bayamare can go to CSC and um, these junior teams here. You can take two or three players every two weeks and you can just go there. For a Romanian junior player standing there and Johan comes in and Johan tells him, listen, buddy, this is how this works. Even if Johan is wrong, you will teach that boy something that he will take forward. Because that's the big thing is they have two or three training sessions a, a week and they play... Touch rugby, the whole training. There's no structure. There's no nothing. You can't you can't expect to to have diamonds coming out of that. You understand? Yeah. You 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 don't have to have you don't have to have a development um, course in Snagov. You can start locally by just having players that are already in the suit, and that costs no money. By the way, that costs no money. That only costs time. Um, yeah. So. Obviously, I've thought about this before, so that's why I think I spoke a little bit too much. Um, but um, yeah, so I don't, I don't disagree totally with the fact that um, there should be. Um, I think the way that the competition is structured at this very moment makes the Super League work and makes obviously that that you can have a higher level of rugby, especially in the top four teams. I'm speaking now for Stawa, and Tamisho, Randy Namo, and Bayamare. So you can have a high quality game there. That obviously will breed. That's your breeding ground for the national team. Basically, eighty percent of the players come from those. So it's very important that you get those games to be at the highest level possible, so that the players that come from there are at the highest level possible. Um, and then one one last thing again. Um, I will probably someone will probably drive me over in the street for saying this out loud, but I do believe that the players should stop going to France. Um, you can only be allowed to go to France if you go play in the Pro D2 or higher because for you to go play in Federal 1 or something like this you might as well just play in Romania and you will give a bigger player pool and also strengthen this competition you know because now you go play there it's fine you get game time you get all of these things it's very nice you come back there's going to be a massive level difference between you have to so you have a a and number nine, who plays in France, he plays in the federal one. And now he plays against France, against DuPont, which plays in the top 14. There's already a massive level dis description. Yeah, there's, a, there's a big difference. So you can rather play in Romania. The game will be better here, which will be better for the Romanian national team. I know a while ago in South Africa, they, they implemented that. They changed it a little bit. But that's, again, that's just because of money. You said South Africa doesn't do foreign players. It's because of money. It's simple. The South African currency is nothing to the euro. So no, no foreign player wants to go there. Don't make no mistake. The guys who go there, they go there at the end of their career to experience rugby in South Africa, like Freddy Michelak and like these guys who went there. But otherwise, you will be not so smart financially to go to South Africa if you can play for euros. Yeah, it's a very good idea that you present to us, and um, uh, uh, in special the last the last one, it's it's a brilliant idea. Why to uh, to send the players to federal one or federal two that the level is not so high, 
and instead to keep the players here and to de uh, develop their sk uh, skills and the uh, play uh, to be much higher uh, and also to encourage the, the competition uh, here. Uh, please, Johan, tell me how you see the the uh, the debate uh, about the foreigns in uh, Romanian championship. I agree 100% on what Nicolas said. Uh, Nicolas is a smart guy. He knows rugby, you know, so he knows what it's about and exactly what he was saying. The problem in Romania is there's a lot of sports and people send their kids mostly to handball, to soccer or to box or some of these sports, you know, because their parents are, first of all, scared of rugby. I know a lot of parents that are scared to the kids to go there. Um, they will rather or they think about money. You know, because um, other sports, obviously, they pay more in Romania. We need It needs to come from higher up. They need to start investing more in, in rugby. We need to speak to higher ups to let them get to the game, to see the game more. Um, they need academies in Romania. Uh, there is no academy. There's, people say, okay, there's an academy there. I don't think they know the structure about an academy. It's a, it's a big thing. It's, it's, where, it's how South Africa develops. Uh, their players. We got, we play rugby in school. We have we have more uh, rugby players, more leagues in school than we have the big ones. Um, I mean, South Africa have five big teams. Everybody knows this: the Sharks, the Bulls, the Stormers, uh, a Western Province, sorry, the uh, Cheetahs and the Lions. Then after that, you get uh, other nine smaller teams, uh, which is the Pumas, Griquas, Griffins. Um, I forgot all the teams, but uh, yeah, then SVD, uh, um, so these smaller teams. After that, we have a university league where we play university rugby, where those guys come and they come and fill this. After that, we have Craven Week. We have so many competitions in South Africa, and this is why South Africa is very successful, is because of the youth, what they do in the schools. In Romania, it, it doesn't exist anymore in the schools. So it forces you to bring in foreign players to learn from them. I think I think teams learn more from foreign players. Go, go look at Japan, for instance. Japan's rugby was very bad in the past. Everybody knows they used to get big scores, even though they made it to the World Cup. They brought in foreigners to learn from them. They are very smart. They learn from that, and that is how Japan was able to beat South Africa in uh, the 2015 World Cup. Because they brought in those foreign players and they paid them a lot of money, Romania will not invest like this. So Romania needs to do something different, but also learn from us. You know, I mean, like Nicholas was saying, we we give our we give always advice to the younger players. Trust me, uh, some Romanian players they don't do this. They don't give advice to them. They because they know maybe this guy will take my position. You know, no. But we we go to these young players. I remember how I was speaking to Kosho to Roshu when I was there, giving advice, Yanku giving advice to those guys and look where they, they arrived because they listened a little bit and they, they changed their mindset. Some don't and they stay behind. You know, um, I think foreigners in Romania and me and Nicolas, we, we, we are guys that love rugby and we want to make a future in Romania. Look at me, I, I stayed here. It's not like I came here, like other players took a little bit of money and then left, you know? No, I stayed in Romania. I think this is this is makes a difference because we are passionate about the country we love playing here. Um, I mean, me and Lucas were good enough to play in South Africa. We could have stayed there. We could have played there, but we wanted something different, you know. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe me and Nicolas stayed in South Africa. We would have played for the Springboks. It's a possibility. It's not. Um, but also in South Africa, it's about size. There's a lot of things to discuss. But seriously, my my opinion, like Nicolas was saying, it's it's good for foreigners to come and to to help out. I want to ask you, and then I, I give the uh, the pass to, to Paul. Uh, I want to uh, ask you because it's very important for me. We uh, think about ourselves. We are very kind, uh, how say uh, people, and we uh, encourage the foreigners to come in our country because we see ourselves like um, uh, how say a very open mind um, country and. Um, I want to know about your opinion about that because maybe we see ourselves, uh, how say, uh, not so good, uh, like uh, how you think about us. So, what is your opinion about Romanian people? It's like we think about ourselves, or it's a little bit different. Romanian people, they are not so open mind or open, 
uh, arms with uh, with uh, strangers? Um, I've I've been here for a long time for eleven years, so I've learned to know the Ra Romanian people. And um, no, my we are majority... racist. I want to be uh, and please tell me, Romanian they are racist and don't be afraid to tell that because I want to know the truth. We we don't think that, but maybe we see other ways. So please be honest with us. No, I I think I think uh, Romanians is a lot like South Africans. To be honest, uh, we feel the same. Okay, me and Nicholas, we come from backgrounds where we we grew up and in a country that that is racism is a big thing. You know, um, I uh, our parents not necessarily teach us, but there was there was the divide in that country, and we were divided from the black people. You know. Uh, we didn't at school learn to get along with them, but as time continued, we developed. And yeah, Romania, I think sometimes Romanians are also racist yeah. towards them. <laughs> okay, it, it, good. Because, it, you know, uh, sometimes we don't see the truth. We think, oh, it's not true. But it's it's very um, necessary to be honest with each other because then maybe we see, oh, we are wrong in our ideas, you know. So please continue, Johan. Um, yes, <clears throat> um, Romanian people are very warm-hearted. I felt I felt very welcome in this country. Uh, people treat me with respect, treat me well. Maybe it's because I also speak Romanian, and I learned, and I and I always talk about how much I love the country. I really I, I love Romania a lot. Um, uh, I've 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 been in France as well. There, I didn't feel that much um, love, or or I think I feel the French were more. Um, I don't say hate, it's a strong word, but uh, they were different, you know, they treated me differently. They keep a lot in, in themselves among French people. I understand they are very patriotic, um, but I mean, they they invite foreigners to come over as well, you know, so I mean, they, they, they would understand <clears throat> the fact that it's also held, but yeah, no, Romanian people are very nice. I don't know how Nicolas feels. He could say something different. No, but I want to be honest and don't uh, say words only that we want to hear, you know. It's yeah. not about that. It's about to be honest and to look on the mirror, okay? Maybe because I do all the time, maybe uh, all all day I do my uh, uh, autocritic and I say, oh, what I do today is not good for me because I do that and that and that. So it's very good to be honest with each other, maybe to see, okay, it's not like we are thinking, it's like, this is the truth, you know. This is what you do, do good and what you do wrong. So please, Nicolas. I I think if you ask me this question in the first few months that I came, it would have been a very different answer to what I'm going to tell you now. Um, I have I have a lot of respect for for Romanian people now since since I've been living here for some time. I love and enjoy the the brutal honesty of Romanian people. Um, they don't um, beat around the bush. It's straight. It's either you're fat or you're not. You understand? It's um, it's um, it's refreshing, to be honest. I enjoy it very much. Um, I have... Um, in the beginning, I didn't feel um, that way, but obviously I've... I've paid thousands of lays on Romanian lessons and I'm doing my best to get the language under control. Um, at this point, I would say I understand it pretty well. I can, I don't get lost in town anymore. Um, <laughs> I can uh, speak for basic needs. So obviously I'm also trying to be as, um, as accommodating to the people who was obviously hosting me at this point. Um, yeah, so no, um, in the beginning I thought that... Romanian people are not so friendly. Um, in general, most people still are not, but I think that's across the world. I think that's a generational thing now these days, you know. Um, people don't look you in the eyes when they shake your hand. Um, people are on the phone when you speak to them. And that's that's not something that I can honestly pin down to one country specifically. There's, there's certain values and things that, that are getting lost through the time. Um, I love rules and regulations and you know i like to think that i walk a straight line now that i'm a little bit older so you know i believe in certain things like you get up when someone walks into the room you shake when you shake someone's hand you look them in the eye 
you say good morning in the in the morning you know um these are things that over time got much better in our team in in Bayamare because um, i think at um, at the start when i came there was a few things that was quite difficult to me um i i come from a very um how can i say like a like a very old school upbringing my parents are very old school um i come obviously from the countryside in south africa far away from everyone so um you know if we were naughty you know my dad would pull you over his lap and you would get a few good ones for being naughty and i think sometimes again this is probably not a general view but i still think you know discipline is is um something that's definitely getting lost and you can see it through like the sloppiness um all over like in youth in general um but i cannot specifically say that i only experienced these things in romania because it's a universal thing um but now knowing some romanian people and making friends outside of rugby um with their kids and everyone and you know you started to love mitch never thought i would be able to do it um still struggle with mama liga um <laughs> can't really can't really get it down but the people in general now i feel a lot more warm towards um and um, at this very moment in time i do think i i enjoy romanian people romanian people's company yeah it's true uh, what can i say also for me it's not so easy to live in belgium also like you say people see you with another eyes uh, they are not so warm sometimes i cannot say i have friends like uh, from belgium people but um, if you are thinking like a big picture yes it's true uh, maybe now on those day these days that we are living uh, the natives uh, look about uh, foreigners with uh, maybe a little bit different eyes they try to protect their culture or maybe they try to protect themselves and uh, like you say also romanians they are they don't have the diplomacy art they are very straight on if they want to say something they will say uh, no matter what so maybe yes you are true we we are not so diplomat uh, but i think also it's very good be- for something uh, somebody else because you tell the truth instead to smile and uh, then to speak about uh, his back i think it's better to tell the truth no matter what and then you how say you resolve your issue, issues uh, with each other you know so now i want to pass the ball to paul and um, uh, for the last part of our podcast to speak about uh, a little bit about the world cup and uh, i know paul have some interest uh, interesting uh, question about uh, for you guys well uh, before switching to the world cup i would uh, want to say that i heard what um, what both of the guys uh, said uh, and i fully agree that's the only way to develop rub- rugby in romania uh, as we see it already in georgia which has a strategic partnership with the south african federation if i'm not mistaken and they did a pretty good job also portugal you saw at the rugby world cup the level was pretty good uh, of course we know that the season is not over yet at least for nicolas because uh, he has one more game uh, in the rugby europe super cup and i want to ask him uh, about uh, the next match which will take place i think saturday correct me if i'm mistaken uh, yes yes uh, against the spanish side of uh, castilla y leon iberians uh, how do you prepare for international matches because you played several matches uh, this season and not only this season obviously against uh, great teams from uh, uh, from Europe how do you prepare specifically for this one last match because it is the last match of this, the year at least for you um yeah this this super cup was um very nice to be a part of i think it was a, it's a nice tournament and um Yeah, I it's a, it's a shame it's a shame that it lines up exactly with all the big games in the Superliga that that there's no like time that that we can also have maybe a week off between games. Um like if you take so we had to play Tel Aviv, Timișoara like the games are it's big games all lined up and obviously we 
as a Romanian team, you don't have a big squad. You have 35 players, which some of those guys aren't really ready to to hit, obviously, these big games. Um, so I would have I would have loved to have maybe just a week in between there somewhere so we could freshen up a little bit. Um, because I think if you look at our team carefully, I think you would probably be able to spot a little bit of fatigue and like see that the season has been quite long. Um, preparing for these, um, how can I say, these Super Cup matches, we didn't do much different to what we would do in our usual um, local competitions. I think you, there was at the beginning definitely a lot of excitement um, because it's something new and obviously now we're traveling all of a sudden and not by bus, which is nice. Um, you're flying to the game and um, again, didn't really know what to expect. So I, I feel sometimes in general as a rugby player, when you don't know what to expect, you go a lot harder just to protect yourself. Um, so obviously got out of the blocks really good against the Czech team um, with all due respect Um Obviously, was a little bit of an easier game. Um, again, with all the respect to the Czech team, they obviously probably just didn't have such a good day at, on the time. Um, then again, the level changed completely when we when we uh, went into the Tel Aviv game. Um, obviously, heavily South African dominated team, um, which was nice. I understood their lineouts, um, but. Going into this last game, again, won't be much different to the Dynamo game. We might have a little bit of a video session to recap on the mistakes that we made against Dynamo. Um, not looking forward to that, obviously, because then you feel the hurt again. And um, we'll probably look at one or two, one, not one or two, look at a few things from the Spanish team going into that just to to obviously get that visual picture of obviously how the guys look, what they do, what to, what to expect. And... Um, yeah, after that, it will it will pretty pretty much come down to obviously having a good travel, having a day there to just get the travel off and then hopefully just pitching up for the game. Paul, well, uh, I want to uh, also to let you to ask the guys about the World Cup. Uh, yeah. I know you you are preparing something for for both of them. Uh, of course, I watch all the games in at the rugby world cup and as uh, both uh, Johan and Nicolas mentioned earlier Romania plays played against South Africa but before that knowing that Johan played at the rugby world cup before in 2015 I would like to ask uh, Johan specifically how it is like to play in a rugby world cup Johan I cannot see you like very straight <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I charge. I'm charging my phone, and some somehow the video changed. I don't know how to change it back. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, yes, Paul. Um, for me to have played in a rugby world cup, I think everybody wants to do that as a rugby player. They, this is their dream. To to, the, I think this is the ultimate stage to play at. Um, and I was fortunate that Romania, in that time, when I came to Romania, the rule was still three years. So I was lucky that uh, I qualified in three years and it was just before the World Cup. I didn't know this. I didn't come here to play in the World Cup. I came, first of all, to just play something outside. And then when I came here, they said to me that if you are good enough, um, you will you you can play in the World Cup. And um, back then, we, Romania still played Challenge Cup. Um, so we had more games, you know, I think that was when Romania was, uh, rugby was good because we had so strong games against the English teams, against the French teams and Romania's rugby was good. I, I think the Super Cup is good again that they are doing that. It would be nice to see more um, teams in Romania to play there, to up the rugby a little bit more. Um, but that that prepared us for the World Cup, and back then it was so amazing to play in a stadium with ninety thousand people against Ireland. Um, nobody nobody gave Romania uh, nothing in the in the you know they did they didn't expect us to come firing, but we scrummed everybody in that uh, World Cup, you know Fr France Ireland, and it was so amazing to to see how the people were ch chanting for us. You know, uh, this is what's special about a World Cup is if you are losing, if you're a small team, I think sometimes people will start chanting for you, will will scream for you. Because you're you know? the underdog. 
Yes, exactly, exactly. Because you're the underdog and they, they love to do this, especially when you do something good, like watch Portugal. What Portugal did, they did, they were amazing in the in the World Cup. And look, they have the opportunity that I think me and Nicolas have been waiting for our whole life to go back to play in South Africa for, um, they, they, they're going to play against South Africa. I saw they're going to play a test match yeah. against South Africa, which I wish Romania had that uh, opportunity, you know, for a long time. But yeah, no, a World Cup is is amazing. I, I cannot say more because as a supporter and as a player, obviously it's different. But um, it's it's an experience and it's it's a once in a lifetime experience, which I wish you're, a lot of players could achieve. You, you were also involved in the greatest comeback in the history of the Rugby World Cup against Canada, from fifteen <laughs> love to seventeen fifteen. It was yes, an amazing um, match. I mean, I remember. I have to I have to to say this. I was. Uh, uh living in a rent uh when i in the city where i studied in Cluj for a, a, more specifically and i was shouting like a madman i have to say it was <laughs> unbelievable i don't want to imagine how the romanians which were in high numbers from what i understood in the in the standings in the in the stadium i, I think the atmosphere was electrifying Tell me more about that specific match because it is historic not only for Romania but also for the Rugby World Cup. Yes, um, you know, for, for for me and Marius Tinku, back then we lost our parents before the World Cup. Uh, Marius in the World Cup, me before the World Cup, I lost my I lost my mom. You know, it was something emotional for us that we we brought something special. We 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 lost the first game against France very close. It wasn't a big score, as people thought it was going to be. Um, then the second game against Ireland, it was expected. Ireland is a good team, you know, a much better team. Then when Canada came, Canada, we knew we knew it was going to be a hard game against Canada because they were very good back then. Canada was a very good uh, competitive team, you know. They had also some South Africans playing in their team. Uh, DTH from the Maravid that scored some of the most points I think in that World Cup or he scored a lot of tries also um, yes yeah, so we were down and in the change room we came in and they said boys this is your opportunity You, they, they, they're not better than you maybe we made a little bit of mistakes let's get back let's uh, play a little bit more of a forward game and this is what we did we mauled them we scrummed them Makove scored that first try from the back of the scrum when we scrummed them he picked up and he scored then we saw we can, you know, and then it was up to Vlaiku that, um, you know, unfortunately in Romania, people throw him away and they forgot what this guy did for the country. You know, he made a thousand international points. It's amazing. The first Romanian to, be, to score more than 1,000 points. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. To be to be from such a small country and to be on the world stage with these achievements. And what is sad to me, um, Victor, you also know this, is... Um, Unfortunately, they throw away players that used to play. Look at Firko as well, Makuvei, uh, Chobi Gal. Players that were thrown away. Uh, people don't say much anymore about them, but these guys did a lot for Romania, you know. Um, yeah, no, th and that comeback was special for all of us because I played with those guys and uh, to be in that team, it was amazing to know we made history, you know. It, uh, it was a very special feeling. Uh, yeah, and now coming to present days, 2023 20, World Cup. You were not selected, obviously, but you saw the matches. And uh, uh, as both of you said, and I want this question to go to both you and Nicolas. Um, can you help me with the camera a little bit, uh, Johan? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to how to fix this. It's good. <laughs> oh, it's good, it's good. I will leave it, I will leave it. Don't touch it, don't touch it. It's good. <laughs> now I can see it because I I was like this. What it's uh... <laughs> so going back to, to my question, uh, how do you rate uh, both of you uh, the national national team's performance, the Romanian national side performance at the Rugby World Cup? Because there were many critics, and I read the press, I read everyone uh, criticizing, criticizing, criticizing. I, I told to many people. I spoke to many people and said, look, what do you expect? It is it, how it is. Let's just be happy that we made it to the Rugby World Cup. We have the opportunity to play against three very strong teams and another team, which is Tonga, 
uh, another valuable team. So I'm interested, how would you rate the, the performances at the Rugby World Cup, both you and uh, Nicolas? I think Nicolas can go first, and I have something to say after that. Uh, but yeah, Nicolas okay. can go first. Um, um, yeah, firstly, obviously, there was a, there was a lot of a lot of back and forth and behind the scenes and a lot of changing of things over the years in um, in Romanian rugby. Um, I think before you can rate the performance of the national team, obviously, you just have to understand that changing the management of a national team nine months before a World Cup isn't smart, I think. Um, it doesn't matter who um, is in charge. You, they, they put Eddie Jones in charge of Australia nine months before the World Cup, and he's not even there anymore. So it's a death sentence, to be honest. Um, so obviously, um, again, I felt very sorry, and I wish I could help. Um, you know, um, the guys that were there, the guys that I know. Obviously, I know the coach very well. Um, I felt extremely sorry for them. I felt like you, you know, it's you're basically walking into already loaded guns just to go take the bullets. Um, they... I think uh, Nicolas has some problem with the connection. Nicolas, uh, yeah, there are technical issues. Uh, Nicolas, I think you have some uh, some uh, connection uh, difficulties. If you hear us. Maybe you can do uh, something about that. Uh, until then, I will give the uh, word to Johan. Maybe uh, you uh, you'll continue, and then uh, maybe when Nicolas will uh, be back on, we'll uh, let uh, him to continue his idea. Yes, um, obviously for me, um, not being selected for the national team was was very 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 sad for me, uh, especially what I brought to this country in the past and how I played for the national team and what I've done. I mean, it's the past. It's the, the, the past is the past. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think personally, like Nicolas was saying, the managements were changed, you know, at that second. Uh, then we had to play another uh, different... I was there. I was in the first two weeks. I was in the, in the squad. I did well. I came back from a knee injury. They said to me that... Um, you are not the same player you were before. You have a knee injury. I worked very hard to get back. I spent a lot of money to work on myself to get back for the national team. And I felt I was fit enough because I was running the... Uh, we did the Bronco test, which they, they love to do before the game, uh, to see how fit you are, you know. And I beat everybody, all the players in my position. I did all the fitness. I beat them. And for them to come back and say that um, I was not good enough, you know, uh, it's, a, it's, it's still it's a very... Sad point for me, uh, personally. Uh, I really wanted to play this World Cup because in the two 2019 World Cup, I was not allowed to play because we got disqualified, you know. But it is what it is. Um, I, I don't think people went there to necessarily lose. I think Romania tried to play their best, but um, just the systems and stuff that was changed and uh, also lack of experience. There was a, a lot of lack of experience in, in that team. Uh, look at Ireland. Ireland took some players with them, not necessarily to play experience, and they just they kept that those guys there to keep the young boys intact. You know, I think this is very important. This is what didn't happen uh, for Romania. Uh, before I let Nicolas to finish his uh, sentence, please, Johan, uh, tell me, you think there are other interests that uh, behind the scenes that we didn't uh, saw that, uh, like. Uh, uh, they uh, keep you away from our national team because me and others uh, supporters they are uh, we are very very sad uh, when we hear the news that you are not be uh, able to play for us because I know and we know what you do for us for our national team you play in qualif uh, qualification games so uh, for us it was very very sad and uh, not only about you. Uh, also, several players, they are keeping away from our national team with a lot of experience that could help us to make uh, better games. So, uh, before I um, uh, send the pass to Nicolas, can you answer this? I don't want to go too much into it because there's some things that I thought that happened that uh, a lot of people would not like to hear. But, um, yeah, 
unfortunately, they I felt that they left some players that were supposed to be there. Okay, maybe, I don't know, they thought that it was good at that time to not choose me, but I've always shown when I'm when I play in, um, important games, I, I was never I was never a player on the training field. A lot of players need to train well to play well. I I was different. I train to practice myself, to prepare myself for the game. And when it comes to the game, I'm a different player. Everybody has always said that uh, you were a different player in the national team that you were at Bayamari. Some players were telling me why, how could you play so amazingly for the national team, but just average for Bayamari. It's not necessarily that. It's just like I felt that for the country to put that shirt on you, to 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 represent the country is something way different. It brings something different out of you, and also from a coach's point of view, uh, Lin House, um, he liked me. I won't say a lot of people said, yeah, you 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 were his favorite or whatever. It's not that you know that coach gave me the freedom to play. I did things that I couldn't believe I was able to do. Uh, how I was playing in the past, you know, uh, because Lin Hal said to me, do what you can. Even if you make a mistake, it's okay. I will not grill you for this. Just be you. That guy brought the best out of our national team because he let us play. He let us just do what we want. You know, and then you could see Romania was 13th in the world or 12th in the world. I can't remember in that time. Because we 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 had the freedom to play. He let Ferkur play. He let... Um, it was Makuve. He let all of these players just do what, what they can. You know, there was not necessarily a big structure behind everything. It was more based on the players. Uh, I think over the past years, Romania tried to change too much uh, the Romanian team. They didn't play a Romanian game anymore. They tried to bring something from, from other countries, you know, to change the the way they play and to try to play with the backs. Nicolas will know this. He's a, he's a smart guy that... Romania started playing with the backs more. I don't say they don't have the backs, but the forwards have always been dominating, you know. And uh, they changed that up, and this is this was a very big problem. Nicolas, please continue your idea because the connection it was a little bit. I, um, yeah, sorry for that. Um, I don't, uh, I don't uh, can't um, obviously spoke a lot. I don't know where you guys last heard. Obviously, I heard you on mentioning the fact that I said that the coach changed, um, or the the, the coach. Change which I think I, think, I don't think um, if you take into consideration, you know, look what happened to to Australia. Okay, you 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 see what happened to to Australia. Basically, the same thing. Management changed nine months before the World Cup, and they had a disastrous experience there. Um, I I felt um, sorry for the players and obviously the coach there, which I have relationships with. A lot of my friends were there and obviously the coach that is our coach at the team, which I have daily interactions with and I do have a lot of respect for him. He's definitely a Romanian man who loves rugby. Um, I don't think all the supporters know this. I know obviously he gets a lot of um, comments and you know is under fire most of the times, but unfortunately... That is the position he's in, and obviously that's something that you know before you, before you take the job. You know, you know that it comes with massive responsibility, and that you will have to take it. Um, I, I didn't really understand the fact that you would have someone coach a team, and then you get a consultant in to overrule the coach. That doesn't make sense for me. Um, it doesn't matter who the consultant is. You could have got um, Rasi Erasmus. Doesn't matter. Like then you have then there's the vision in ideas. You know, sometimes if everyone commits to a bad plan, it can be an average plan. You understand? So um, th those are some things that obviously I have questions about that obviously no one can answer for me because I've never been in that system. Um, me, um, as a player, I believe a lot in chemistry between in a group. Um, I think it's very important that the group gets along. I didn't get that feeling um, with the World Cup. There's a, there's a lot of division in Romania, between different clubs, firstly, different clubs, then different generations. That's that's another division. So now you're already splitting the team into a lot here. You know, you have small little groups that don't get along. That means the team will fail. Um, so those are the things that I felt. And this was from the side. So I don't know how it felt in the middle. Um, Johan can probably speak a little bit more being in camp and things. Um, I have the general feeling that People are scared of other people to succeed. Um, 
not just in rugby i think in general here you, you get the feeling like there's a lot of like, like holding people back because you're scared this guy will, will go places um yeah and then you have all of this contributing to like not going there 100 percent ready and in a mental state i know i know they prepared physically they prepared very well yes the guys were in a in good condition and they were they were very fit and yes um jason tomani came back from one of the camps i almost didn't recognize the man he, he was in extremely good shape um so i know they prepared very well um like like you said and then third on top of the fact that i don't think the chemistry was good there was division um and then i also do think like you said i felt like the team lacked identity um identity meaning they didn't really know what they are good at so in the past Romania played a very basic type of rugby. It's strong, physical, slow rugby. Okay, so you go scrum, set piece to set piece, waiting for a penalty. You have a guy like like you kick three points. You stay in the game like that. Okay, you can compete. And then by the odd chance that something spectacular can happen, you have a guy like Adriana Apostol that can turn you know anything into magic on the day. One of the luckiest players I've ever seen in my life, by the way. Um, <laughs> Yeah, then you have a person like that who can make things happen for you. So the identity, I think, was a little bit of an issue. I do think if you would match up this national team with previous national teams of Romania, I think then you would be able to see, obviously, how much rugby these guys wanted to play. The, I think the team at the World Cup this year wanted to play rugby. You have, you have players who can create space. Who, But unfortunately... There was just the vision, and there wasn't really good connection between. Okay, now we run it, now we ball it, now we play slow, now we play fast. So basically, you have a Romanian team trying to play Ireland style of rugby, but they can't really execute it that well. And at that level, against that competition, obviously, will never work for you. Yes, guys. Uh, the general opinion and my own opinion, it's like we do a mistake to change the the, the coach before the World Cup with nine minds. You don't have enough time to prepare and to make a, a stronger national team. Uh, then uh, you push away the leaders, the the guys and the players with a lot of experience. You push a, uh, you push it away. Uh, then uh, uh, on the competition or before the competition, you bring a consultant that uh, take the uh, main uh, position of uh, coaching. Even if it was not official, he was uh, preparing the the, the 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 team. Also, some emerging uh, from uh, others uh, like a management uh, management uh, uh, rugby team. Uh, they uh, they interfere with with the team. So all those things uh, make uh, for us a really bad uh, World Cup and. Um, we cannot say uh, we can learn something about that when you you are beating uh, from uh, uh, South Africa, Ireland, or Scotland with uh, more than 60 points. I don't think you can say I learned something about that. You cannot say I learned. It's uh, uh, we don't make a, uh, uh, how say we don't put problem to those teams. Uh, they don't feel like they have a strong opponent. Uh, before them uh, on the pitch. So uh, for for me, uh, I say it's my own opinion. It was a, a, a several uh, mistakes uh, uh, that uh, our management do with uh, with our teams, like I said before. And uh, it's it's a lot of things to debate, but we don't have the time necessary for that. We are uh, uh, we are closer to to finish the podcast, and I want to say um, to tell us what means for you uh, that uh, South Africa uh, won the second title uh, world, uh, of world champion uh, through rugby. What means for you? Um, I I think um, obviously being your country of birth, obviously you're very proud. Um, I will obviously not play for that country, so I don't care. I, I, I will never say I don't care. Obviously, I was extremely happy and very proud. And what makes it even better is we have some New Zealand guys here in the team. So that made the day even more special, um, you know, sharing a beer with them and watching the final. 
So that was a great experience, having one over on, you know, on your friends. I think that's how probably Johan feels today, uh, being able to chat with me after the final, you know. You have that that silent little bit of confidence, you know. I got one over you now. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what um, how I felt like um, in the World Cup. It's it's extremely nice knowing obviously what it means for the country. That is very refreshing and nice to know, you know, to the happiness that it provides in South Africa and and just in general, everything goes better when the rugby does well in South Africa. So that is that is very nice to know. And obviously, I'm very proud of the fact that South Africa won it. But I think my views and obviously my um, priorities definitely changed a little bit over time so obviously now i would like to to represent romania moving forward and obviously stay here for as long as the people will have me thank you nicolas johan uh yes for me it was also special it was a little bit sour for me the fact that i wasn't at the world cup but uh i got over the point and uh yes i i supported south africa i've always supported romania more like Nicholas was saying, because we don't play there anymore and we know we're not representing the country, even though it's our birthplace. I would have loved to see Romania do better. I thought they could. Um, you know, unfortunately, they changed a lot before before the World Cup. Um, they they thought that they could bring in youth. And th- I, I think this is not something you can do. Okay, it's good to have some young players and to develop, but not in a World Cup year. You don't develop then. You do it before. And it wasn't done before. They wanted to use players' experience to qualify. When they qualified, they changed. You know, I didn't. I didn't understand uh, a lot. A lot of management um, uh, mistakes was made. A lot of management from the. And this is how Nicholas hit the point exactly. I was saying there was the vision in the national team. <laughs> what I felt before in the national team, how we were together as a group, was not this time. It wasn't. There was. There was a lot of small groups coming in from France. These guys keep like this. They st- I think there were some coaches that kept more of their players from their teams to play. They they wanted to choose favoritism, you know. And I think this this is it's not it's you're you're playing a World Cup. You need to put the best players on the field, which would uh, gel the best. You know, is what we have a saying that would get along the the best. And this is how we. I mean, how can Portugal that Romania beat Portugal also? How can Portugal? Play so, so such good matches, and Romania look like nothing. We look like idiots on the field, you know. And it was sad for me to see. But yeah, at the end of the day, South Africa won it after um, I think it was their fifth World Cup to win um, two in a row. Which uh, oh fourth, sorry, it's fourth. <laughs> uh, their fourth yeah, World the Cup, second, second in a row. You, you yeah. were right. Yes, two in a two in a row for South Africa. It was amazing to see it. I I don't think people uh, necessarily back South Africa. I think they thought New Zealand was gonna gonna take it. But South mm-hmm. Africa, when you are when you are they're like Romania, you know. If you are backed, if you're if you are put in a corner, they will always find a way out. You know, this is what I feel about Romania, which was similarities. You know, um, but yeah, to get to the point now, it was amazing to see South Africa win the World Cup. Thank you, guys. Paul, if you have some, uh, the last question, if you want to address. The, uh... Uh, not necessarily a question. I would rather make a comment regarding uh, South African performance. Uh, for me personally, and it's just a matter of opinion, uh, I enjoyed very much uh, the team uh, during the World Cup. And I was somewhat, I had a premonition that they would win. Mainly because they trashed uh, New Zealand before the Rugby World Cup. We have to remind that South South Africa defeated uh, New Zealand by a huge margin before the Rugby World Cup, 35-7, to 7, if I'm correct. Uh, of course, I have to note the fact that South Africa won all the knockout matches by only one point difference, which was extremely tense. And I do have a question, actually. Uh, many people saw the match against France and the controversy surrounding uh, Chesling Colby's move. Uh, what do you think about his move when Thomas Ramos wanted to convert the try? Uh, oh, many I people. Think. It was very interesting because many people said, "Ah, he broke the rules," but it's obvious that, for me personally, it was perfectly legal what he did. 
So I want to ask you about uh, the situation. How do you view the whole thing back then? Um, it's it's interesting. Um, obviously, I love to to debate about um, officiating decisions and obviously these kind of things that happen in the game. I think the reason that there wasn't a bigger deal made of it in the game is because it's such a rare thing, you know. It's such a rare thing. I think officials obviously have a very difficult job, firstly. To be an official of a rugby game is... I wouldn't want to do it. I think it's very difficult. So now you have something that happens that you rarely see. It makes everything even harder for the official because now he has to make a call that probably not a lot of people would agree with. It's definitely a 50-50 call because half will agree, half will not. Um, was it legal? In my opinion, I'm South African. I would say yes, he was perfectly fine. Um, you <laughs> well, know, totally but, understandable, obviously. You know, and then obviously from a French perspective, you would probably say something different. I think the basic law says if the guy moves, you are allowed to start running. And he moved. Is there, yes, there was a slight movement, but you know, all these kickers have all of these different little moves and shakes and all of these things. So, I'm, you know, am I happy? Yes, I'm happy because it will probably teach the guys just kick the ball and stop doing all of these other things. <laughs> um, so, at the end of the day, as a South African, I would say Chislin Colby was fine, but I do understand if you feel differently. I do. Johan, how you see the the play? You think it? Um, we must we must remember that Cheslin Colby played with Thomas Ramos at Toulouse. Uh, he knows him. He knows the way he's kicking. He chased. So obviously he knew when he starts his run up. They've played a lot of games together. Um, Cheslin Colby is a very fast guy. Uh, I was at Toulouse for a for a trial run back in the day. You guys might remember in 2017 where I got the contract and I lost it. But yeah, that's the past. Um, I, I saw how Cheslin was there and how these guys, you know, they knew each other. Dupont, but Dupont back then was just trained by the coach and he became such a good player. He was still young. Um, yeah, to get to the point, Cheslin knew what he was doing. He knew the meters in between. Ramos maybe were very, a very confident, he's a very confident guy. And I think he was too confident and he knew he's going to kick it and he didn't expect that. So he took a slow run up and I think Cheslin just at that precise time Got there. I mean, there were video evidence that Cheslin was on the line and he chased in that exact time when he moved, you know, uh, which is perfectly illegal. It was amazing because I mean, I think that's a game winning situation for South Africa. It turned uh, out maybe, to be. Yeah, yeah, maybe they would have lost the game, but uh, that changed everything. Guys, thank you. Paul, uh, thank you for uh, your hosting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted only one thing to add. Uh, before finishing, because uh, yes, please. no, we haven't spoke about the final, which was uh, way too much, and uh, of course in the final, uh, one particular guy stood out, which you know we all know who was was Peter Steph Dutoy, uh, with no more than twenty eight successful tackles, and it was amazing uh, to see throwing his body all over the place and uh, for me personally that man alone or I wouldn't say alone but he was probably the most important piece uh, in the final for uh, South Africa so that's pretty much it from my perspective I would I just wanted to note that uh, performance yes but definitely a special performance I think all team, uh, all uh, also the bomb squad and uh, also the guys who uh, who help uh, South Africa to won the the second title in a the row, they they do an amazing job. Uh, also to to beat all those great uh, nation, they, I think they have uh, the difficult uh, uh, line to 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 the final, uh, and it was great to see uh, uh, this performance of these great. At least because they are a great at least before of all, and uh, for us it was a privilege to to see them on TV and also live. I was uh, to Lille. It's uh, very close uh, uh, of my uh, of my place that I live, 
it was a great uh, moment that I live uh, there in France, uh, also on the TV, to see uh, uh, such a great competition with such a great uh, games be between the uh, those teams that uh, make us to to love this game. Guys, thank you for your time, Paul. Thank you. It was such a great help uh, that you, you today. You you are the new host. Uh, of our podcast and you are doing such a great uh, job thank you Paul and also Nicolas and Johan thank you for your time thank you for your uh, uh, rugby that you offer uh, us uh, yesterday on the final uh, congratulations Johan for your uh, title and uh, of your birthday congratulations Nicolas for your uh, job uh, to buy Amare and uh, I want to see you in the future to our national team and maybe to be our next leader that uh, in my opinion, now, on this moment, uh, we don't have, after Makovey retire, retiring, we don't have a, a leader in our uh, uh, in our national team. So thank you, guys. And I hope uh, I will see you next time with uh, great news. And uh, how, how can I say when you, Nicolas, will be our, in our national team? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, and yeah, let's um, see what the future holds. Um, but yeah, thank you for having me. This was a fantastic experience. Um, uh, congratulations, Johan, once again, with both your birthday and the final. Enjoy it. Obviously, it doesn't last forever, you can ask me. <laughs> um, Paul, thank you for everything. Um, this was a yeah, pleasant experience. And I'm really looking forward to see you playing in the Rugby World Cup four years from now. You'll be 34, but who knows? I th I think that makes you even a, a more special athlete to be playing at this age because uh, honestly, well, uh, like I said, we'll see what the future holds. But yeah, that that feels like a stretch for me going that deep. I'm already struggling a little bit with my knees and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Johan, uh, you want to say something, please? No, I just wanted to thank you guys for this podcast. I think we were it was special uh, the four of us, you know, picking each other's brain. Uh, seeing our point of views uh, on a lot of subjects uh, and thank you guys very much for the wishes and uh, Nicolas, thank you for the game yesterday as always it was very hard to play against you um, and good luck to you uh, to your games that you have and to your family and uh, I wish all of you have a great Christmas and a great uh, holiday season and hopefully we can speak uh, do these more often you know uh, pick each other's brains and and talk about, and I hope Nicolas makes it to the national team. He deserves to be there, and I think he could be a good leader. I've never seen a guy talk so much to a ref. Good sense, no, and not in you a don't see me. You don't see me. You will change your mind. I think you'll we'll change your mind. <laughs> Nicolas, literally, because he speaks sense, you know, to the ref. Uh, you close the mic, uh, Johan. I think he have some problems I got, in the mic. I got a call from uh, the coach. Um, yeah, I I think Nicholas would be a great uh, um, plus for Romania, um, especially as a leader. He's a very good captain. So hopefully we see him there in the past. Thank you very much, guys. I, I think we could speak more, <laughs> but it was it was a very nice time. I had fun. Also, I thank you guys that you are watching us today. We are the new international podcast, Sport for Life, Rugby Mania. I hope uh, you will embrace us. You will uh, su subscribe with our podcast because it's very important for us to have to reach all over the world uh, to the rugby fans, to, to show them the Romanian uh, side of uh, rugby because I think we deserve that. To, uh, to know uh, more about us and also we are looking of your uh, national teams. So guys, please, if you're watching us, subscribe or maybe share our podcast because uh, we have such a great guys with us today and maybe in the future, who knows. And uh, thank you for watching us and uh, see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys.